The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, everyone has their candles lit? OK. So you can start the quiz. All right, so time's up. So you can just turn, hand all the quizzes just down the lanes to get to me. That would be great. Um, given the amount of background and expertise you have in this area, I'm clearly not going to grade these quizzes um, uh, with a lot of cruelty. So <laughs> I don't know how to put it. They'll be graded leniently, so don't stress too much about getting it through. The real idea was to call it a quiz so that you had some motivation to do the work and then to experience doing work with a variety of different lighting situations, all of which are pretty limited in um, function compared to what you're used to. So we're going to do part of the lecture in the dark. So you should, you can keep your candles and lanterns and whatever you want on because that's all we've got for right now. Um, oh. I would ask that you don't use your flashlights too much because they're really noisy. So um, first, I just want to talk about what it was like to use each of the different lighting sources and like to have to do work doing all of them, do, using them. So what, what, well, we started with just candlelight. So candlelight was quite difficult. Very difficult. It's very, it's very limited light source, <laughs> um, low light distribution, and it's a very small radius of like lumens. Uh, well, it's actually lux. Um, yeah. It's actually low, very low lux. Um, so it's inconvenient, um, and it's definitely a way and just make sure you speak loud enough so everyone can hear. So when people are sick, everyone's huddling together. Yeah, Kurt, did you have a hand up? Uh, I'm not sure if Carter said this, but it flickered a lot. It so flickered a lot, yeah. You got this like when the flame was more protected, that helped. Yeah. What else about the second candle helps? <laughs> diffuse light. Yeah. It helped diffuse light and kind of. Uh, made it a lot easier to or distribute the light a little better. Yeah, absolutely. So the the second candle has the diffusing aspect as well as the wind protection, both of which add a lot to um, their functionality. Um, and then next, I gave you guys some aluminum foil. How did you use it, and what did you find it useful? So let's go to each group. So how did you guys use it, Missy? Um, we put it under our two candles. Um, spread out the light a little bit along the table, so like since we're all in crouch over here, it really helped. It did help. Yeah. And how about you guys? We ended up like this. And did you find it helped? Yeah. yeah. And then okay. back there. And, and reflected it towards towards the writing area. Cool. And how about you guys? Great. And you guys actually started with some tinfoil that I guess you got from lunch. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So, and then we added the um, the flashlights, I think. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And some of you guys used them and some of you didn't. So for those who used it, what was good about it? Like, yeah. It was very bright, very... Concentrated, it was nice. Um, just the lifetime, lifespan of it was very short, so there's a lot of work that needed to be put into it to get the light that you desire. Um, so, short term, sure, it's a nice use, but, but it's a lot of work. Exactly. <laughs> so, maybe one person would like do it and the other person would write a quiz and it's a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you guys liked it, Jessica, yeah. 
Um, Help us yeah, I totally agree with what Carter said. Um, also, like when I started with the candles, the first one was kind of annoying. The second one got so much better. By the time that we had the lantern that you provided, the flashlight that you provided us, plus our three lanterns, I was like, there's so much excess light here we don't need. Yeah, and so it's kind of phenomenal how at this point, I imagine most of us are relatively comfortable in this level of light. Whereas if you had walked into the classroom in this level of light, you would not have been thrilled. <laughs> um, but starting with just a candle, having all these light sources is actually decent. However, can you imagine studying for your final, during finals week, using this amount of light to comfortably study? Would this be, would you opt for this? <laughs> Probably not. I sure wouldn't. Um, I'd want a whole lot more light to read comfortably and write comfortably. Um, or if you were sewing or cooking, etc. So this is both a surprisingly small amount of light to be highly functional and yet very clearly not enough for really optimal. For the people who didn't like the flashlight, what was, why did you not just opt not to use it? Yeah. It was just really harsh, like compared to the, like the candlelight is a lot softer. And so when you put the, um, the flashlight on, it was just this harsh bright light, but it was like it couldn't go everywhere. And at one point we had some person holding it, it was just like, at, like, for lack of a better word, kind of inconvenient. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Your eyes adjusted to it so that you like couldn't then read anything that didn't have that light on it. Mm -hmm. so, so then you were beholden to it. Yeah. So, yeah. And how about the back group? We didn't use it. I, I started using it, pointing it to papers, but then my hand kept like moving because mm -hmm. I had to squeeze it. So I think it'd be useful for like, I don't know, like late at night walking somewhere and shining in front of you where you don't have to like focus it on an area. Yeah. But uh, for the purposes of this, it was really annoying. Okay. And then your lanterns. What did you guys notice about your lanterns? Any ones that you were pleasantly surprised or pleasant or unpleasantly surprised about your, your the utility of your lantern oh, a lot of people notice Carter's reflection on the ceiling yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Aesthetics, just, just <laughs> 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 Better sideways than like straight up. And your your original intent was for it to be straight up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. like this light's like around, but if you're trying to read, you want it like yeah. Around. Yeah. How many of you used your lanterns in the dark when you built them? Cool. So that's great. Um, definitely, this is a, the kind of thing where ideally you would prototype it in the dark um, if, as you were building it. Any other thoughts on the lanterns? Okay, um, great. So I wanna just run through um, any big questions you guys had on the quiz. So, and I am gonna turn on a bit more light because it's really hard to lecture. I learned this the hard way last year when I couldn't do anything um, trying to lecture. So it's gonna, I'm gonna get a little more. So <laughs> um, for, are there any major questions on the first page? Okay. And uh, the answers will be posted on Stellar, so um, yeah, you can see them. Um, what did people get on the um, first, first estimation? We don't know what we are first Say again? Oh, we turned our quiz. What was the question? <laughs> That's really unhelpful. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't think this through. Um, so the first question is, have, how many average incandescent light bulbs could an average adult power by pedaling on a bike? Oh, two. 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 Two, eight, anywhere else? OK, so that's about what I got. So uh, we're all in the same realm. So. 100 to 200 watts pedaling, which we talked about on an er in an earlier class. Uh, and then <coughs> excuse me. And then we have 40 to um, 100 watt bulb. So dividing that out um, is anywhere between one 
and five bulbs. Is that vaguely what you guys did? Yeah. Great. Uh, can you see this at all? Yeah. In the back? Yeah. No. Um, so you no longer have to maintain your family bonds. So if you want to move forward so you can see, feel free to do so. Because um, I don't know how to, maybe I can try this headlamp. Let me try this one first. Does that help? <laughs> okay. Um, and now I feel really awesome, fashion-wise. Um, okay. So, second question is the how long will a solar lantern last at night turn to its maximum settings of four LEDs? And so I heard a lot of questions on this one, like, what is a solar lantern? I don't have any context for this. What are you talking about? And one of the muddy cards that I got last week was, why are we doing all these ridiculous estimations? Um, are you just trying to make me feel stupid? Um, <laughs> and no, I'm really not trying to make you feel stupid. And I totally get that when you get this estimation question, and it's written just the same way as a normal, um, problem set problem that is basically, you know, like, how do you integrate x squared? And you're like, I know how to do x squared. I know the exact right answer. I can do it 100 times. And I'm giving you this question with not enough information, not enough details. It's a really different feeling. And it can make you feel really insecure and foolish and stressed out. Um, and part of the reason we're doing this over and over again in every class is so you get used to it and you get acclimated to it. So that immediate stress response, oh my god, I don't know the right answer. Um, I'm a moron, oh my god, dissipates and is replaced by, all right, well, I don't know off the top of my head. Let me think about this. What are the contexts I can use? What are those techniques that we talked about in the first day of class that can help me start to approach this estimation problem so that I can come up with some sort of answer? Um, and that I'm going to be confident that I'm not going to get the right answer, but I'll probably get in the right order of magnitude or in the ballpark. And that that's what we're going for here. So it's to get practice with doing this so that you start to feel more comfortable with it. It's never going to feel the same as when I ask you how to integrate x squared, because it's a difference between rote memorization um, slash like truly understanding calculus and approaching a brand new problem with very little information and very little time and knowing how to handle it. But the latter is really powerful. Basically, anyone can learn calculus, calculus with enough time, but learning estimation takes some practice at a different level that's really, really valuable long term. So no, I'm not trying to make you feel stressed. Um, and the, the goal is when you see this problem to spend less time on the what the heck and more time on the, well, let's approach it this way. No, that's not the dead end. Let's try this way, this way, um, and just get fluid in those different approaches. So this question, the solar lantern last, what did you guys um, come up with? How many hours or days did you come up with? Yeah, Jessica. We, I was actually going to say that um, I really like the estimation because, like, for example, we already jumped to some of the assumptions that we knew, that we knew or calculations from last class, mm -hmm. but we forgot to account for it. For example, we were thinking of a three meter squared panel, and here a lantern is not going to be three meters squared. Yeah. So what I'm going to say is that we supposed that we're going to have a storage device for the, that's going to be three meters squared, okay. and our lantern is only going to be like the output sort of demand Okay. Um, with the four LEDs. And yeah. in that calculation, we got like 3,000 hours. OK. So given your um, assumptions, that doesn't sound crazy to me. But I bet other people didn't make the same assumption on the size of your solar panel. So what were some other assumptions and answers? Yeah. Well, we assumed um, our solar panel would be a quarter of the size of the smaller solar panel that we used last week. Uh, then we also assumed that only 20% of that solar energy from the panel would actually be converted into chemical energy for battery storage. And subsequently, when we calculated everything out, it was around three hours total. OK, great. So that's a huge difference. But there's some really vividly different assumptions that mandate that that's a reasonable difference. Do you remember how big the panel was last week and then a quarter of that? So we can just compare. It was, it was about a, a 
foot squared, so quarter uh, quarter of a foot. The calculations that we didn't have on the board with the meat were three meters squared. It's a it's just a one kilowatt hour. Did I record that correctly, Jessica? The, it's three meters squared is what you assumed? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what about you guys? We decided that the, uh, like, we would have enough solar panel to fully charge like a 9 volt battery. Um, so then we just used the 9 volt battery, um, which you said had about like 15 kilojoules and then um, charging the four LEDs for an hour would use like 1.2 kilojoules, so we got about 12 hours. Cool. And what about, did you, I haven't talked to you guys yet. What um, did so we said installation on an average solar panel on one meter squared is 4.6 <coughs> kilowatt hours per day. Um, and so then, uh, let's see what we do there. Then we had, what did we do there? We calculated the wattage of four bulbs, um, four LEDs. And we came out to be 375 um, hours, 375 hours. Mm -hmm. But then taking into uh, consideration 20% efficiency, all around that'll go down to 75 hours. Of okay, so th three out of the four groups were all in the same range, and then one group assumed a much bigger solar panel than is typical for a solar lantern, but isn't, is not untypical for um, a, a, a lighting system in a house, or not atypical necessarily. So none of these are um, out of control. So that's great. Um, are there any other questions on the quiz? And I apologize that I made you hand them back before I asked you these questions. <laughs> yeah. Is there ever a situation where that's, you know, practically used? So lighting design and <laughs> measurements is really, really strange and, in my opinion, not being a lighting expert. Um, and it is a very wishy-washy because of our eyes and how it's, we basically don't have a sensor that can use our eyes and then there's so many criteria like you have the source the light at the source and then you have what it goes through and then what it reflects off of and where you're standing and if I'm standing here versus here that changes my experience of that lantern really drastically um, where you can see me much better if I stand here but I can't see you at all because I'm completely blinded right so no no, no I do that intentionally so um, that is the reality of lighting, is it's a really wild um, thing to measure and understand. So the, a lot of the metrics that people use are less um, precise or comfortable than, say, beam bending or other things that, as a mechanical engineer, I'm a little more used to. So I'm going to run through these today, um, and hopefully they'll get clearer. But I can't say that I feel 100% comfortable in all of these, and I wouldn't expect that you are going to do either at the end of the class today. But it's more just to give you a taste of how lighting designers think about this. And if you end up working on lighting issues, um, having the capability to know where to go to learn more. But yeah, efficacy, yeah. They're all lux, lumens, candle power. It all just is frustrating, um, the whole set, which you guys experienced today, I believe. Any other questions on the quiz? OK. So, um, so now what I want to do is just show you a bunch of different light sources. Um, so you guys can leave your candles on, but maybe turn off the flashlights and lanterns so that um, Unless it gets, unless it's really awful with just the candles. Um, so to start with, so this device is called the D light, and it's one of the more um, well-respected uh, lantern companies out there. It's quite robust, though um, some of our community partners who use it, it's far from 100% robust. Um, it has a bunch of different brightnesses that you can use. 
Um, it has a nice diffuser that makes it work pretty well. You saw how well it worked here um, compared to like this headlamp um, gets you much more directed light, but it's, that's a lot less useful for most situations. Um, so the D-Light is really pretty great. It comes with a solar panel. Um, it comes with, I need two lights now. Um, <laughs> it comes with uh, a spot so you can charge your cell phone off of the same battery that you, you charge the light on. So um, it's, it's pretty well respected. D-Light makes another light that's smaller, that's cheaper, that I'll show later on today. Um, but we don't have a version of it, unfortunately. Um, other lanterns. So this is made by Freeplay, which is a company that started with radios. And they also do a lot of lanterns as well as radios. And it's a, a hand cranked one. But it's a little bit nicer than the hand crank ones that you got, or really a lot nicer. Um, and you can see that the lantern works relatively well. Um, there are some things that you might want to change. Um, at the break, we'll turn on the lights, and you guys can look through all of these um, with full light. Um, but what I want to do is just compare the different light that you get out. Um, this is a uh, lantern that I think is Thai. Um, and it has a, a dimmer and then a sort of funky diffuser. Um, and yeah, all of these I'm just going to show, and we can sort of think about the pros and cons. If there's obvious ones, I'll show you. Um, what? Uh, I think, I don't know what it's called. It's made by Geep, G E E P. Um, this is the. Um, the BOGO light, which is getting distributed a lot around here. I'm not sure where they um, get their money, but like everyone I know who has one got it for free at some conference. So, <laughs> uh, so they're distributed a lot. It has a big solar panel on the side, um, and then it has different levels of LED lighting that you can use. Um, it automatically turns off if it's in the sun. Some of these do that, so if it's too light, it won't let you use it to run down the batteries. Um, it has a clip so you can hang it on something on your backpack or wherever. Um, another one that IKEA makes is kind of neat, um, is a desk lamp. And there's a similar desk lamp that the, um, that D-Light makes. Um, the thing that's kind of interesting about this is that the solar panel pops out. So you can leave your light inside. And then you can take your solar panel and put it outside so that it, it um, captures the sunlight you need to power it. Um, the drawback is if you lose that centerpiece, you're stuck. <laughs> um, so there's a pro and con there. Um, this is a light that takes like a little LED simple. Can you guys see this at all when I do things like this? OK. Um, takes a little. LED, just hand light, and then it has an extender for it so that um, it diffuses the light and makes it um, useful in other situations where you just don't just want the task light. Uh, it's a little hard to use. Um, a lot of lanterns are based on the classic like kerosene lantern that looks sort of like this. Um, this one is a modified design that Oof, so bright. <laughs> that uh, has a fluorescent light instead of using kerosene. Um, but it's still very similar design. Um, what else do we have? We have a whole bunch. I'm going to start getting just to the ones that are interesting. This is one that should remind you of your solar lantern, kind of. Uh, or not solar lantern, but DIY lantern. Um, because it's very much DIY. And the, connection is a little flaky. Um, but you can see it has a built-in switch. Sorry for the glare for some of you. Maybe I'll point it this way. Um, it uses an, a CD as the reflector, which works really well um, comparatively. And then just wood for um, holding the batteries and a found switch. Um, most people in developing countries, if they upgrade from candles, upgrade to kerosene. So I'm very quickly going to show you kerosene. So here's a kerosene lantern. And what do you notice about it? 
So it's totally smoky, it's smelly. <coughs> Kerosene is pretty dangerous. Um, so I would be hard to imagine wanting this in your house if you had to, um, for a variety of safety reasons. Um, and certainly carrying it around would be dangerous. And it has the same flickering issues that a, a candle has, obviously. So I'm gonna blow it out now so we don't smoke <coughs> ourselves out. Question. Yeah. Powered then, or whatever that we use when we're like outside lanterns to keep the mosquitoes away sometimes. Yeah. So sometimes that's more kind of like luau torches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same kerosene. So that's one of the things that um, kerosene offers is mosquito repelling. And that's one of the things to think about for all of these lights is that traditional lights do offer some benefits that people like, like mosquito repelling, like um, heating in some areas. So then, and just going back to grid light bulbs for a minute, um, we have a setup here. So watch your eyes. Nice. This is a 40-watt um, um, incandescent light bulb, which is comically low in um, normal housing, but and yet when we're used to this low light, is ridiculously painful. So then you can add a reflector, which makes it a little less miserable to use. Um, but if you notice just the color of the light and then compare it to this incandescent or this fluorescent light, um, this isn't the fluorescent light that's the same color as these fluorescent bulbs. They've actually done a lot to um, improve fluorescent light color uh, temperature to make it more pleasing to the eye, whereas LED lights are still quite um, comparatively blue. This one has a nice diffuser, so it's less painful. But you can see how drastically different the color of the light is. And light color really tends to impact people's mood and perception of uh, the life and how much they like the lighting. So while LEDs have a lot of potential, um, the color temperature issue is, is strong. Um, the, um, the light I was using earlier, the headlamp, was really annoying because um, like it's great for task lighting. Oh, this is a better one actually. Um, but it's very, I blind you really fast, right? So they invented this diffuser, um, which I think ups the dork factor an amazing <laughs> amount. <laughs> um, but, um, and there's a reason, like I found this at REI on like more than, it was like 75% off because I think no one's buying this. Because while the idea of a diffuser makes a lot of sense, um, if it doesn't look good, you're in trouble. Um, and this really has a lot to be desired in terms of um, how good it looks on. Um, and that's true everywhere, that what, um, what a device looks like matters. OK, so. Um, so yeah, so at the break, we can look through all of these. You can look through all of these different lanterns we have. OK, so I'm going to turn on the projector now. Um, about the Kinkajou projector, which was actually um, originally invented here at MIT uh, in um, 2009. So here we go. So that's the Kinkajou, um, which, as I mentioned, is. Uh, an uh, offshoot, and you can notice already how much brighter this classroom is just from the little projector. It's sort of shocking from the art trajectory, which is amazingly bright now. Um, so the Kinkajou projector, again, came out of MIT's 2009 class and then th went through a lot of iterations to where it is now. So I wanted to show some of those iterations. So this was the initial prototype that came out of 2009. Um, I need a pointer or something. Um, there, and you can see it being tested here. Um, and then it went through two iterations to where it currently is today. You might have heard them mention that they used Fisher-Price optics, which sounds really funny, right? <laughs> um, but toy companies do an amazing job of getting costs down really low and then producing in high volume. And so one of the things that can be really handy is if you know that their toy is going to stay in production for a long time, you can harvest those parts. Um, and that's something D-Lab Health has been starting to do. Um, if you know that something's just going to be readily available for the foreseeable future, why not use those parts? Um, it's a lot cheaper than manufacturing it yourself or even buying it yourself sometimes. Um, so 
And the reason I wanted to show this is just because I think a lot of, t one of the reasons I want to show this is because a lot of times we sort of think about um, prototypes is like, oh, we have a prototype and then we have production. And instead, like in 2009, they probably did three or four prototypes to get to this point. And then this just throws three prototypes and there's actually many more um, that they had to get through to get to a version that they could actually produce in relative quantities. And this is still in the order of magnitude of hundreds of projectors, not thousands or tens of thousands or millions. Um, one aspect of the Kinji projector that also came up in 2009 in a second year was how do you power the Kinkaju. Um, and so students worked on um, this device, which is basically a rowing machine um, to power the device, which worked really well. Um, Harvard students came up with a treadle powered device. And then what they're using currently is a battery pack that connects to a solar panel. Um, these devices, can you think why a solar panel might be chosen over these devices? Way more portable. Way more portable, absolutely. Yeah. Minimal work, yeah. Noise. Noise, yep. Time saver. Time saver. <laughs> yeah, so these, um, the price of these two sets is relatively similar, but it's a whole lot easier for Kinkajou to ship solar panels than it is to ship stuff like this. Um, and then there are some gender issues which were addressed between this and this in terms of who's allowed to use um, the power, but still, um, it's no one wants to be sitting riding a um, bike or doing, um, doing a rowing machine while you're in the classroom if instead you could have a solar panel. <laughs> so while human power is great, and we talked about that a lot last time, um, there's still opportunity for improvement. Okay, so this lecture is adapted from um, Suzanne Seitlinger, who um, was in the Smart Cities part of the Media Lab, and she got her PhD last year. I'm not sure where she is now, um, but she taught this lecture last year, so that's where this is coming from. So just to give a little bit of context, um, one and a half billion people don't have access to electricity. Um, about a third of the population in this situation lives in India. So that's why a lot of the projects we're going to be talking about are based in India. Um, also, India has a relatively um, a high growth that's providing wealth to a lot of people and then still a very second set of people who are getting very little benefit. And so the contrast make, means there's some resources and some opportunity there too to do work there. Um, and the International Energy Agency doesn't predict this is going to change very quickly. Um, so most people are relying on other fuels, kerosene, dung, wood, diesel, candles, battery powered flashlights for lighting. Um, and all of those have some real drawbacks. You saw the drawbacks of kerosene and candles, at least some of them. Um, you can imagine the drawback of battery powered flashlights if nothing else is just the cost of those batteries. Um, wood is really dirty. Dung is as dirty as it gets in terms of indoor air pollution issues. Um, and it also, interestingly, like just as wood is bad for the environment, dung is also bad for the environment because it's a really great fertilizer. And in regions where they use a lot of dung to do other things, the quality of the soil goes down dramatically. Um, and then diesel, unsurprisingly, is rather dirty and dangerous, similar to kerosene. Um, one other issue that's really interesting is how much you pay if you um, if you have modern lighting as opposed to kerosene, it gets very expensive, very fast. So this is just a, a set of the range of how expensive um, different lighting is compared to how um, how light it is. And this slide is really um, hard to parse, and I added color to it to make it a little easier to parse. But basically what it's showing is how much the, the y-intercept is how much the, um, the initial cost is, and then the slope is what is the continuing cost. So ideally, you want to be like right down there, right? So free to start and as low as possible, a very low slope so that the cost of ownership isn't going up. So for example, um, uh, solar five watt compact fluorescent lantern um, is really expensive um, and it just keeps going up in cost 
because even though you think it's solar, it's free, it tends to break a lot. Um, and so the cost keeps going up. So it's really expensive. Um, candles start out free, but they keep going up. One thing I found really interesting was a simple kerosene lamp uh, has a pretty l nice low slope compared to most of these technologies. And then the hurricane kerosene lamp goes way up. And I was wondering, what's the difference? Does anyone have a thought? So a simple kerosene lamp is like this one. And then a hurricane kerosene lamp, it's sort of like the, like the classic lantern that you imagine, sort of like this, but with um, kerosene in it instead of. Um, any thoughts as to what the difference, the discrepancy is? Yeah. So that's one possibility, yeah. Uh, I don't think it burns brighter. Yeah. Doesn't it come with like, something on the inside that has to replace? Uh, yeah. Lanterns? Yeah. So both lanterns have wicks, right? That's how you get the the kerosene lantern to work. And a um, simple kerosene lamp can use really, really simple wick. And a hurricane lamp requires more expensive wick. And so that's the cost driver. And it's sort of phenomenal, because you'd think, oh, I so much prefer a hurricane lamp, because it's going to enclose it. It's going to make it a little less smoky. It's going to make the candles flicker a little less. But if you have to use this special wick, it's going to cost so much more very quickly. Um, and then a grid-connected 60-watt incandescent lamp is pretty great. Um, a Comport fluorescent, as we're all familiar with, costs a little more initially, but then your slope improves, and hopefully um, you make back your purchase pretty quickly. So I, f I found this graph to be really interesting. Um, when you start to have questions about what the differences are, I put up the assumptions for table that table. Um, but generally, up to 30% of it, yeah, so not. Yeah. Uh, so when you when you talk about slope as compared to kerosene, are you talking about like like on what basis um, are you estimating the cost of electricity? Like, is that the cost in the U.S. or the cost in like? In so you can see on here. I mean, you can't read it right now because it's too small. But you can see the assumption. So they assumed oh. that um, grid electricity in rural areas is about ten cents per kilowatt hour. Um, okay. Yeah, no, of course you can't see that. It's impossible. Um, I can barely read it. Um, so I'm not, I didn't put this up so that you could read it, but that's so you have it on your slide so that you can look through it later if you have questions like that. Um, yeah, and I didn't expect you to be able to read that whole slide in all of three seconds or whatever. Um, so yeah, so, but I put that up there. So when you have these questions of comparison, it's easy to figure out what the assumptions were. And these assumptions are a few years old. So some of the drawbacks of solar and LED lighting are getting better, but they're still, um, I'd, st I'd still say we're, we're in relatively the same picture with some improvement. Um, so financial costs are a big issue with lighting. So people can spend up to 30% of their income on light. And in this country, we 3% is the best estimate I could come up with, but it's really, really high. Um, because when we collect um, data on what we spend in the US, you don't really break it out, like you don't break out utilities and how much of your electric bill is light versus how much is your electric stove versus your electric water heater, et cetera. So 3% is really high. Um, so people can be spending up to 10 times more than we're used to spending, um, which has a huge burden, of course. Um, environmental costs are severe from the pr proper disposal of batteries to wood deforestation. Um, and then one that we don't always think about is light pollution. So that's less of an issue um, in super rural areas, but it is affecting everywhere more and more. And certainly in this country, light pollution has a really big impact. It's great to have light from a safety perspective, but then from other perspectives, um, light pollution can be really problematic in terms of pleasure at night from being able to enjoy the night sky, being able to have a darkened room at night, et cetera. Um, social costs of not having light. Um, so everything becomes difficult at night, as I think became clear <laughs> just now. Um, so people who don't have light go to bed really early compared to people who do have light. Um, there's some agricultural work and other type of work that need to happen at night, either because they have peak periods where like if you don't fish in these, you know, this one month, you want to fish as much as humanly possible. And if you can't fish at night, you lose a ton of money. Two things like people um, 
collecting rose petals that has, has to be done at night because once the sun comes up, um, the flowers uh, start to wilt. Um, it means you just have less time in your day because you only have the time of the sun. Um, it disrupts education if you can't do any night school. Um, you can imagine how challenging it is to do surgery with no light um, and get medical care and no light. And so if you have any problems when the sun isn't up medically, that can be really dangerous. And then of course, just security issues. Um, it's well understood that having lighting helps with security. Uh, in terms of health costs, Breathing kerosene fumes and other smoke in indoor places is awful, the, including the particulate uh, method uh, emissions. Um, there's just the danger of fire started when you have a fire lit. Um, that's why I actually included the, the candle holders for the first candle is it gets, those candles get really hot and I didn't want anyone to get burned. Um, and then just eye strain um, makes, makes your days harder. Um, so I think now is a good time to take a break, and then after the break, we'll talk about the, um, all those different measurements of lux and lumens and all that good stuff. So it's, as I mentioned earlier, it's a dynamic process. It's contingent on a lot of variables, like um, what are the requirements of the task. Um, you can imagine that reading is a very different task than cooking in terms of what lighting requirements you need, but both you need significant amounts of light to do well. Um, mood and atmosphere are important. The appearance, the aesthetics, the visual comfort related, um, health, safety, well-being, um, the social communication aspect of lighting, the different people's point of view, costs and environmental concerns. So there's a lot to consider. Um, and some specifics, so brightness um, is both the intensity and the amount of light, and you can sort of see the extremes of staring at the sun, um, thankfully through a camera lens, um, and how bright that is versus the glows. And this is not coming out that well, so I'm going to turn down the lights a little bit. Does that look a little better or the same? I can't. It looks a little better to my eye. Um, so the glow and then glare is an issue that you guys all experienced, I think, today of getting shined at by one of my lights or one of your lights in your face and you really can't see a thing except for the light that's blinding your eyes. So um, I won't glare, blind you right now. <laughs> um, contrast is another thing to consider. So something with very positive contrast where um, the object is brighter than the background as opposed to the reverse where all you can see is the silhouette because the background um, is brighter than the foreground. Um, and again, like obviously if there's no contrast, you can't see anything. And then one thing to think about is illusions associated with contrast. So you've probably seen this before, but this color gray and this color gray are the same color. And it's just the black versus the white that changes um, your perception of gray. Um, you can click here in the slides to go see a cool animation where they actually like um, move the, the gray off and on. So you can literally watch the contrast happen and the perceived change in the gray color happen right before your eyes. It's kind of cool. Um, and that's called white's illusion. Um, you guys all experienced candles in terms of contrast issues. Um, and you'll notice, like, obviously, I, I'm not going to, I could light a candle right now, so why don't I? When it was pitch dark, um, the candle was really, really evident and useful. And now it's kind of bright but it's not as shocking <laughs> or as useful um, as it was. And then another thing to notice um, in this picture, and because it's a painting, it's a whole lot easier to get the contrast than if it were a camera, which is why it's a nice picture to use, is that this candlelight works pretty well for lighting her face, but it's probably pretty terrible for lighting her way in terms of not tripping on anything. And so candles have some aspects that they work really well on and others not so much. Um, the color temperature issue we talked about, so I think this will be less painful now. Um, still a little painful, but not as bad. Um, so the extremes, um, and you can see like the candle color temperature versus incandescent versus fluorescent versus 
like improved fluorescent versus a more traditional fluorescent versus the LED. It's a huge range. And even if we had no lighting um, and just were using the sun, the difference between sunlight and shade uh, is pretty significant. So we're used to some range. So expecting that there's some perfect color that will um, that is the one we're shooting for is not necessary. But um, candles certainly are on the far end of the spectrum, and LEDs um, aren't shown here, but are, are on the opposite end and pretty unpleasant. Yeah. So that's Kelvin. So it's like a heat temperature. Um, measuring all of these, you can read up on all the different ways that people measure this sort of thing and the controversy over the different measurements, again, because it's so subjective, it's really hard to get a really analytical measurement that captures all aspects of light performance. So speaking of that, um, just going through the terms, so the lumen, and I find this diagram to be really helpful, is the light that's being in, emitted. And then the luminous intensity, or candela, is the lumens per angle. And then illuminance is, or lux, is the lumens per square meter. And then luminance is the, what, the luminous intensity that reaches the eye. Is everyone totally clear on that? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, all the, the words are somewhat similar. And we're just talking about different ways of looking at it. And because you can only ever see the light using your eye unless you have a light meter, um, which we'll be getting, but we don't have right now. Um, it's sort of difficult to even conceive of exactly what these mean apart from just hypothetically. Um, and then, of course, brightness is subjective and not something that's really easy to measure. You guys look confused. Do you look confused? So, so like, I understand lumen as like an energy and like the amount of light that's emitted, but not as a flux. I feel like luminous flux would be more of a candela. So I, I understand what you're saying, that the way flux is used in this set of definitions is contrary to the way you're used to seeing flux. Um, and I cannot take credit for these definitions, so I can't help you resolve that conflict, only to agree with you that it is confusing. Um. Is that the illuminance versus luminance? You got it. <laughs> What's on this terrain? I'm sorry? This is uh, under luminous intensity, candela, or luminous per terrain. Per radian? Steradian. Um, so it's the steradian is again a strange measure of an angle. Um, I'm not going to ask you to uh, derive or calculate luminous intensity, <laughs> just so that you're familiar with these existence. Yeah. Is it not? No, I think the steradian is a solid angle, right? Uh, yeah. The measure, yeah. No, I'm just gonna, what is, I was going to ask what is the question. Uh, steradian is like the measure of a solid angle. Like okay. A, just, it's like if you have a circle, you know, you have a radian, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. it's just mapping that to a sphere. Okay. So it's the same idea as okay. a radian, except just a radian for a sphere. Okay. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, and so here are a bunch of um, these quantities with symbols and SI units, some of which help and some of which add to the confusion, like the difference um, between light incident on a surface versus light emitted from a surface, it all gets complicated. And so basically, the, t the takeaway from this is that if you want to actually compare two lights and say this one is superior to that one, it's a lot of work and it's subjective. Even with these, hypothetically, some of these objective measures, it's challenging um, because of the nature of our eyes. Um, just sort of like odor. Um, is challenging to measure too. <laughs> um, so when you're using a basic light meter, um, you're measuring illuminance, which again, going back here, um, is just measuring the light emitted onto a surface. So you can compare, when you using a light meter, some of the things you want to do are compare vertical surfaces and horizontal surfaces, um, looking at where the light source is. 
Um, usually, it's very rare in a room that there, or in a location that there's only one light source. Um, when we all had just four candles, there were four light sources. If only one family had the candle, it would have been one light source. But normally, there's a whole lot. There's my computer, there's the projector, there's the overhead lights. Um, there would be light coming in from the windows of the doors if I hadn't covered them up. So you have to consider all of those and then the stray light, light sources. And then whether you're measuring at eye level and where exactly is eye level, are you assuming an average woman or an average man or something else? Um, and then also at the task surface as opposed to the eye surface. All of those are important. Um, just to give you a sense of order of magnitude of how bright and how unbright. Yeah, did you have a question? Eric, did you have a question? Or was your hand just moving? Sorry. Okay. Um, so we can range a whole lot of order of magnitudes from a bright star at night, which is still pretty dim. But if you've ever been in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night, it's amazing how bright stars can be on a moon with, in a night with no moon. Um, it's surprisingly bright once your eyes adapt. Um, to um, moon, how strong a moon is, uh, to a living room, hallway toilet versus living room. This really depends on how well your toilet and your living room are lit compared to each other. Um, there's a lot of variation here. So this is general metrics, but there's a lot of variation, of, cor of course. And then sunrise or sunrise, sunset is going to be much brighter than your living room. And then going all the way to full daylight and then direct sunlight um, is incredibly bright and piercing. So if you think about like sitting on a beach with no clouds, just how bright that is. Um, it's shockingly bright. Yeah. How does an overcast day have more lux than a sunrise or a sunset? What do you think? <clears throat> does anyone have a, a hypothesis for why an overcast day has more uh, lux than sunrise or sunset? I guess there's overcast day has clouds, like has a diffuser, and then where sunrise and sunset is not direct sun, but more of the, I don't, I don't know which word to use. <laughs> but not non-direct. Non right. Sun. It's very indirect, and the, the angle of the sun is much lower on the horizon. So the percentage of the sun that's, that's actually, the rays that are actually um, providing light to you is significantly lower, um, and, and there's a lot more diffusion. Yeah. Um, so there's recommendations for task lighting, again, in Lux. So we can use the light meter. Um, and you can see that they're typically measured in horizontal as well as vertical illuminance. And that a kitchen, reading, desk work all require a certain level much, much higher than if you're just doing general tasks. And you saw that today, that we could get away with a ridiculously low level of Lux in this room um, and function uh, when we just had candles and maybe a little bit more. But if you wanted to be really reading or studying comfortably, you wanted a tremendous amount more Lux. What do you mean by circulation? Just that, like, going about your daily activities? Yeah. So vertical illuminance would be, like, from the top to the bottom, right? Not, like, going down vertically. So they're talking about measuring it on a horizontal surface and a, on a vertical surface. Okay, so incident on a vertical and incident on a horizontal. Um, and then also outside, we have to worry about a lot of different ranges. And you can see that um, you care a whole lot more about lighting a monument um, if you care about everyone seeing the monument than you do, say, in your garden. <laughs> you can, can be a whole lot dimmer and people can still walk around. Um, and again, when I was talking about all the different areas that you have to worry about, um, you have glare, you ha this is the point of interest, you have light pollution that's going to affect your measurements, um, you have some reflective surfaces, all of these different areas are things to consider. This is one way of looking at it with um, a physical diagram, and this is another one that sort of runs through the different ways that you can measure these different light issues. <laughs> okay, so I've gone through all these different 
basics on how to measure light and these basic criteria. Um, there's a whole lot more content that we could go through that I'm not an expert in um, and I don't think is crucial, but if you do get into this area, it's deep and um, interesting. So again, we talked about just the quality of the light of a hurricane lamp, say, lit by kerosene versus an LED light. The experience is very, very different, both in terms of the experience of how bright it is, the color of the light, the cleanliness, the cost, all of these things are quite distinct. Um, and this graph or this chart really sort of tries to document those differences. So the brightness is pretty um, severely different, that a fuel-based light is much, much less bright typically than electrical light. The quality is much poorer, which you guys saw. Um, and then the reliability, well, either one can be unreliable, right? And you kind of have to define when you mean by reliability what's more important um, to you. Relying on the grid is great until the grid becomes so unreliable that you stop relying on it, um, so, which has happened to my neighbors, for example, um, when NSTAR was really misbehaving a few years ago. So um, it's, it's an issue everywhere that um, things that seem reliable aren't always, and then you start choosing different types of reliability. Um, so now I want to go through some examples of lighting and lighting tasks. So learning is obviously a huge area where light provides a huge benefit to people. If you can be studying or, and or going to class at night, that frees up a tremendous number of hours in the day that you can work. And similarly working, so I mentioned people plucking flowers, people farming um, silk from silkworms, and people cooking. Um, it's all of these things are really benefited from being able to work at night. Um, these two examples are from Selco, which we'll talk about later in a few slides. Um, markets and vendors. So if you can sell at night as well as the day, that opens up a lot of potential profit and potential customers for you. Um, and then we talked a little bit about medical care and the benefit from all the way, you know, from having baby, babies to emergency surgery, where having light at night is really crucial. Um, and then just walking and being safe at night, uh, anywhere from driving to wandering, it's really handy to have light unsurprisingly. Um, and then if you think about how much time you spend at night socializing and how much harder that would be if there was no light to do so and how much um, less time you'd have for interactions with your peers and with your friends and family with, at night. Um, so lights like the street light um, provi you know, provides an opportunity for people to start all of a sudden meeting and socializing and or working together. So some examples of light. So I mentioned the D-Light, and I think this um, light has, has been upgraded a little bit and is now called the D-10 or S-10, maybe the S-10. Um, but basically, it's made by the same company, D-Light, that makes this light. Um, but they, this light is about $60, um, maybe 40 in some places. Um, and this light, they're selling at around 10 um, and so it's a whole lot more affordable. It doesn't offer the cell phone charging and similar aspects, but they've also worked a lot about making sure that it offers um, a really good quality light. Um, some of the limitations of this light, for example, were really clear and just how glaring it was. And it's nice to have light at all, but glaring light isn't ideal. And so they've done a lot with diffusion to make sure that this light is pleasant to use. And this is a nice sort of side-by-side -side picture of using a kerosene lantern versus using a D-light. Um, you can see the, the difference. Um, this is much, much brighter and probably a whole lot more pleasurable to read by as long as it's not too glaring. Um, and they also had two settings um, so that you can save your batteries if you need to. Um, Grameen Shakti, you may have heard of Grameen Bank, um, and Grameen Shakti is a related program where they've been providing a solar electrification primarily for lighting um, to many, many homes. Um, and so they're one sort of classic example of focusing on 
PV systems to provide lighting. Um, Selco, which I'm going to show a video on about in a couple of minutes, is another example um, where, as I mentioned, so they were using kerosene lamps to feed silkworms, which they needed to do at night. Um, and kerosene lamps, as you can imagine, are dangerous. And not only are they smelly and toxic to people, but they're killing off silkworms because they're toxic to silkworms too. And so Sel Selco was able to develop um, a solar lantern system that became affordable through some um, complicated financing methods, which is Selco does a combination of technology and financing that allows people to access solar lighting that they couldn't otherwise access. Um, and it um, has had a lot of benefits. Similarly, solar power powered headlamps, the story on this project is that initially midwives came to Selco saying, we really need solar powered lanterns, um, like headlamps, not just lanterns. Because if you can imagine, when you're delivering a baby, you need task lighting front and center. And if you have a lantern behind you, your body is blocking what you need to see. And so it becomes very inefficient. And you don't want a kerosene lamp right up and close. That's just dangerous. <laughs> um, and so um, Selco came up with a headlamp. But unfortunately, midwives don't have enough clients to pay for the headlamp. So then Selco looked at, well, who else needs these headlamps? And they came up with a headlamp sharing method so that people, um, flower pucker, pluckers, <laughs> construction workers, rubber tappers, and midwives could all share the headlamp so that everyone could benefit. Um, so that requires not only some special financing, but also some special um, community arrangements so that everyone is able to share these um, headlamps successfully. But if when they're successful, it helps tremendously for a lot of different people. Um, so now I want to talk about Selco, or show you a video about Selco. Uh, the founder is Harish Hande. Um, and I think the thing that isn't going to come out in the video enough is what he really learned very quickly, um, but had to do a lot of work to figure out how to address, is that he had people regularly telling him that 300 rupees a month is expensive. But 10 rupees a day is fine. And you can do the math really quickly and see that those are the same, right? That um, 30 times 10 is 300. So why do you think one would say that? But also because, like, I mean, I think it's hard to, it's easier to, like, budget day to day. It's hard to budget, like, an entire month. So, like, it, it's probably easier to, like, you know, save 10 rupees every day as opposed to trying to, like, save 300 per month because you're unsure of a lot of variables. Yeah, so the budgeting, budgeting cycle is actually the huge thing that people using kerosene lanterns would sell during the day. And if they made enough to buy kerosene at night, they would. And if they didn't, they wouldn't. And so that gave them a lot of flexibility f for their budget. Whereas if you spend $300, 300 rupees, and then um, you have a bad month, you're out. And there's no ability to um, optimize that on a short cycle. I mean, I'm also thinking that storing that money somewhere is receipt business, because you don't yeah. want to have saved up for a whole month. Yeah, so. You have the best of budgeting and saving feral habits. Yeah. Then now you saved up for the whole month and somebody steals it or it's lost or burns up because of the kerosene or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so saving is risky and it's also hard. If that, if you've never been brought up to be um, budgeting, which is something that if you live in poverty is not something that you're really doing on a month to month or year to year basis, but are living day to day, shifting to that mindset is very difficult. And it does add an element of risk if you're saving money. Um, you have to save it somewhere that has to be secure, which is a big assumption. Any other thoughts? So, um, and this is Harish's quote, but f having talked to him, my understanding is that 300 rupees a month is expensive, but 20 rupees a day is fine. So people are really generally spending much more to live day to day than they are um, if they could live month to month. But living month to month is a barrier so high that it's completely insurmountable for um, people at a certain level of poverty and below. So I'm going to switch again. 
Street markets are a crucial part of Indian commerce. Street vendors sell everything from vegetables to incense to clothing to handicrafts. Much of the action takes place in the hours after dusk. Normally, the vendors depend on kerosene lamps to light their wares. Selko thought that the street vendors would be better served by solar lighting, but the vendors were in no position to purchase PV panels and batteries for solar lighting. So Selko redesigned the value chain and created a new class of vendor, the solar lighting entrepreneur. With financing arranged by Selko, solar light entrepreneurs purchase large arrays of solar panels that can be placed on a roof or even a vacant lot. Every morning, the solar entrepreneurs connect a series of batteries to their PV panels. The 12 volt batteries are the size and heft of car batteries. The entrepreneurs have a set list of clients in the market. Some get just batteries, others get both battery and lights. The entrepreneur we visited, Dada Hyatt, has over 50 clients. At 4.30, the solar entrepreneur disconnects the batteries, loads his motorized rickshaw, and drives his wares to the market, a few kilometers away. He then delivers the solar-powered batteries to his clients. For the vendors, the solar lights proved to be a good deal. An evening's worth of light costs about 15% less than kerosene would for the same time period. The lights have other advantages over kerosene as well. They cast a wider arc of light, don't smell, and do not pose a fire hazard. For solar entrepreneurs such as Dada Hyatt, the lights are also a good deal. After making his loan payment and paying off other expenses, Hyatt has enough left over to live on. Moreover, he also has the possibility of further expanding his business. Okay, so I think one of the things that's amazing about Selco is that the idea of someone basically renting a light or access to light every day kind of seems obvious and simple now in 2020 hindsight, but at the time is quite radical. And if you, you can kind of imagine why, like it's sort of impossible for me to imagine every day stopping by the market and borrow, you know, renting a light to use tonight, <laughs> like and tomorrow bring it back and repeating. That's so contrary to our societal norm that it's hard to wrap your head around. And so this was a really different approach that would turn out to be very, very successful um, and is a great example of an approach. And why are we talking about this in energy class? Well, any solution has the technology piece, but it also has the business piece. And while we're certainly not emphasizing the business piece, and if you want to, there's other D-Lab classes where you can focus on that, you can't design in a vacuum, assuming that if the technology is good enough, they will come regardless of the financing. Just as you can't assume there's a good enough financing model that's good enough if the technology isn't. Um, and if you re watch a bunch of Harish Hande's talking, he'll, he gets to that, um, that you need both in order to be successful. So that wraps up the lighting lecture that I have. Are there any questions on lighting? So I know you guys are really interested in the community partners we'll be working with and what exactly we'll be, we'll be doing. So I wanted to go through first what students did last year. Um, Amit, do you mind bringing those three products over? So one team worked um, with Blue Energy in Bluefield, which is on the Atlantic coast, where they have a lot of um, batteries, the, these deep cycle batteries that need to be recharged regularly. Um, and the batteries, um, they need to be recharged with distilled water. And if you don't use distilled water, you shorten the life of the batteries by a really significant amount. And these are very expensive batteries that make up a, a big percentage of the system. And people are living in islands and coastal areas where the only way to get to buy distilled water is to travel by boat for a few hours, which is expensive. And when there's any sort of weather, is impossible. 
and so people will naturally just use regular water rather than distilled water. Um, and by regular water, I generally mean well water or worst case ocean water, um, which kills the batteries really quickly. But there's a temptation to just, I, I know we need to fill the batteries, so let me do it with the water I have here if I can't get the distilled water. Distilled water also isn't free if you're buying it. Um, and so what they developed were two different approaches to a distiller um, use at two different cost prices or price levels. So one using acrylic panels and one just using clear plastic sheeting. Um, and then you just put it over a water source and um, the water evaporates in the sun. Then um, and the, when it evaporates, all the stuff that's not just pure water is left in the pan of the, uh, um, down here. And everything that is floating, uh, rolling down the sides is distilled water, and then it collects. This isn't a good option for drinking water, both because distilled water tastes awful and isn't um, as good for you as water that has some minerals in it, and also because it's a pretty slow process. But if you only need a small amount of water per month for a battery, this works really well and um, can be made pretty much out of locally available materials and is pretty simple. Um, and so that was one project that the students worked on. What did they do when they went to Blue Energy? Um, we did a charcoal demonstration um, for people so that they could learn how to make charcoal out of coconut husks because that was what was locally available. That involved going to um, a, a coastal area that is one of those areas where you can't get to except for boat. Um, they called Kakabila. Um, so we spent some time there, um, just learning what the energy situa situation was like, <coughs> helping repair a wind turbine, um, and identifying other projects in blue fields that we could work on. And this is the project that ended up getting worked on. All of these projects are going to be relatively small compared to, say, a 2009 project. And that's the reason for that is twofold. One is that this class, we pretty much work on projects for half the semester as opposed to the whole semester. Um, and the other reason is that I really want these projects to get to completion. So a project that we can actually hand off to our community partner at the end of the semester and say, here, run with it. And they can without it falling apart and being like, oh, it kind of doesn't work. And a lot of projects just naturally in academia get to the, it just works well enough for the presentation, and that's it. And I want a pro project that'll work well enough to hand off, which is a different level. And so that's why we do relatively smaller projects, but we get to into de deeper level of design um, on them. So the next one is a bag sealer. So this is working, oh, and Blue Energy is likely a, a group we won't be able to work with this year. Um, but this group worked with Oso Phoenix, which is a group we likely will be able to work with this year. Um, and Oso Phoenix, one of their projects um, was to make a bag sealer for orange juice. So in the, um, one of the regions that Oso Phoenix works with, um, they have a micro hydro system and they actually are underutilizing that electricity that they're provided. The, the electricity doesn't work year round because the water isn't there year round, but in the rainy season, it, they have sort of a plethora of electricity. Um, and they also have a plethora of oranges. <laughs> um, and the orange growing season is relatively short. So you have all these oranges and you can, you can sell them for very little in the marketplace because all the oranges come to season at the same time. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how do we save these oranges to save some money. And so they looked into preserving the juice and then selling the juice um, and being able to sell that for longer than you would be able to sell the oranges. And so the key piece that was missing was how do we seal the bags. And so um, bag sealing technology exists, but having a simple one that connects to um, a micro hydroelectric system that's easy for them to repair and build in the field um, was something that didn't exist. And so that's what this group of students worked on. And when they were at Also Phoenix, um, again, they did charcoal demonstrations um, as well as identifying the different projects that they could work on. In this, this year's class, we're doing it slightly differently that we're going to pre-talk about the projects and you're going to work on them a little bit before you go. Um, that year, they were really just doing project identification. Um, this prototype has already been delivered to Grupo Phoenix, which is another one of the groups we're going to be working with. So I can't show it <laughs> um, apart from the picture. Um, but this group um, makes uh, solar panels from cells that um, are <coughs> Uh, reject cells that don't meet the specs for evergreen solar. So ever, evergreen donates the cells 
to Grupo Phoenix and they cut them up and make solar panels with them. And cutting a solar um, cell is really, really difficult. And in the field or in the lab, you would do it with a laser, but a laser is well beyond the capability of Grupo Phoenix, which um, is off the grid pretty much. Um, and so th uh, this group developed a fixture for a Dremel to allow a more repeatable process for cutting the cells so that the loss rate went from like 80% to 50%. So um, a big improvement, even though 50% is a painful loss rate, 80% is much more painful. Uh, and then the last group worked with one group organization called CADRE, which again, we probably won't work with again, and also for <coughs> Group of Phoenix, which we are working with again, for a stove and a stove design. So I we introduced the um, charcoal idea to Group of Phoenix women there. Um, Group of Phoenix is a neat community that um, has a very strong uh, organization of women almost entirely. Um, and those women are really interested in alternative energy. And so they, they build their own solar cookers. The solar cookers are really expensive. And so that's a problematic model from a financial long-term standpoint. But from a community building social standpoint, it's a really interesting, very successful model. And so we're, we're interested in working on them to figure out what are some other opportunities they can look into that might be more sustainable long term. And one of them is charcoal. And they're really interested in charcoal, but they all use adobe stoves meant for wood, which aren't appropriate for charcoal. And so I and the students working on this project came up with the idea to develop a stove in a stove. So a charcoal stove that would pop into your adobe stove, wouldn't interrupt your cooking, but would allow you to use charcoal very easily. And the students came up with the idea of making sure the stove is something that could be built by the women um, at Grupo Phoenix. So what they came up with was a stove that can be made from a single piece of sheet metal with just a couple of cuts and then a bunch of bending. And so um, they figured out the stove idea over spring break and then in the summer one of the students went back and introduced the stove, taught a workshop on how to make that um, and got some, tested it with some women to see how it worked um, which is a pretty cool project and so that's this stove right here. So um, those are the four projects that came out last year um, and so this year we fly into Managua, which is the capital city, but we spend almost no time there. Um, the Grupo Phoenix is in Ocotal. Um, we may work in Hinotega, um, and Aso Phoenix is based generally in the Buaco region. <coughs> so Aso Phoenix is a small Nicaraguan-based NGO um, focused on rural sustainable development, and they do a lot in the energy realm. They're actually a group that was spun out of Group of Phoenix, so that's why the names sound so similar. Um, it's in a very, very rural area, which means you have to hike in. There's no um, way to even get a good pickup in. Um, so it's pretty rustic conditions, pit latrines, bucket showers, if there's enough water, um, and sleeping on hammocks. Um, and one of their big projects is they have a feed chopper, and they want to be able to electrify it, because right now it's human powered, and it's a really, really manually intensive system to use it. Um, and then they also have interest in biodigesters, maybe continuing work on the bag sealing project, um, and they're currently having a meeting this week, I believe, to talk about what other projects they'd be interested in. That's one. Second is Grupo Phoenix, which is in Ocotal. Um, and this is a group that um, has a university base in Nicaragua at the Technical University in Nicaragua, um, and has some connections back to D-Lab, um, as well as other universities. So it's a little bit more um, westernized, just a touch, <laughs> but it is very, um, integrate into the community um, with that um, women's cooperative that I mentioned. Um, and so they're really focused on trying to empower the women to um, create better energy solutions for themselves and preserve their natural resources. Um, so this group has comparative wealth in that some of the houses have TVs, things like that. Um, so some of our students last year were surprised by how wealthy we were with the people we were working with. One of the reasons that these women are comparatively wealthy is that this program has been going on for 20 years, and some of the work has allowed them to gain a little bit of wealth. Um, but 
the neat thing about them is that they serve as sort of figureheads for the whole region. And so success that they have make, gets other people really interested. And so it's a really neat program to work with. Um, some of the projects they are interested in, but again, pit latrines, bucket showers is sort of the standard. But you do get a bed um, as opposed to a hammock. So it's a little bit more refined. Um, is refining their solar cooker, ideally refining it significantly to make it much more affordable, easy to manufacture, aesthetically pleasing, et cetera, et cetera, more functional. Um, there's actually a group of Cornell students working on aspects of that as well. So it would be interesting. It'll be interesting to figure out how we intersect. But they're going to be at, at Group of Phoenix at the same time, so there would be an easy way to in, in overlap. Um, they're also really interested in charcoal making and the stove making, and so working with them on those aspects, um, both from developing their skills in making charcoal as well as business plan development. Um, and then they're really interested in figuring out a good way to make cell phone chargers, um, because that's a huge, a solar cell phone chargers, because that's a huge. Um, need in the area where almost everyone has cell phones and very few people have electricity. So charging the cell phones is really difficult. Um, other possibilities that we're looking into right now are um, collaborating with DLab Health because DLab Health has a lot of other projects and they also go to Nicaragua and so it seems natural that we could collaborate and they often have energy needs for their solutions and so it seems like a natural overlap. So I'm talking to them but Jose who teaches the class just got back from Nicaragua yesterday um, so I haven't been able to talk to him about that yet. And then um, I visited Hinotega this summer um, which is another region um, and they're really interested in making charcoal from these invasive lilies in um, their lake. Um, and so that's another possibility. But I don't have strong enough context to be able to be sure that that's going to happen. But it is a possibility that I'm working on. Are there any questions about all of these? OK. So by Friday, I will have a survey online so that you can list your project preferences. Um, and I know these are relatively vague, but that's the nature of this work. Um, and then I'll need you to complete that by Monday. Even if you're not going on the trip, I need your preference because um, you're going to be working on the project apart from going on the trip. Um, and then we'll have the teams formed by the 23rd. And then from there, you'll be assigned a project mentor. And you guys will be working in your teams to work on developing um, initial information, information gathering, initial prototypes that you can bring to Nicaragua to help you have a more informed conversations with your community partners and make a better end product in the end. The other aspect of work that may be happening in Nicaragua, in addition to gathering information about your project, so get, getting feedback on your initial prototypes, your initial approaches, um, is trying to transfer some of our technologies to the community partners we're working with. So for example, um, Group of Phoenix is really interested in doing some more charcoal burns. So we'll do that at Group of Phoenix. And you'll be trained in charcoal burns right before we go, because um, we try to push that as late as possible so that we're not doing it in the snow. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to Oslo Phoenix if they want to do charcoal burns again or if there's some other technology they want. The primary work will be project um, fleshing out the projects and getting project feedback. But there may also be some tech transfer, but not a ton. So does that answer everyone's questions about all of this? Because there were a lot on the muddy cards. So I just want to make sure that's clearer. OK, cool. So now I want to go through the muddy cards um, again, um, which I try to do every week. One person asked, what is the average daily energy consumption for Americans, which hopefully you're intuiting at this point. Um, I, brought, I, t I showed it on the first week slides. It's relatively easy to look up. But um, the average American uses about 14,000 kilowatt hours per year of electricity. Um, so that, that's not all energy that we consume, obviously, but it gives you a, a baseline. Um, uh, someone was confused about how megajoules and kilowatt hours are related. So they're both units of energy. and it's 3.6 megajoules is one kilowatt hour. Um, and generally, power and energy intuition is muddy. So can, can you guys remind me energy is equivalent 
can you can you do a quick definition of the difference between energy or power or a, a metaphor or however you want to define it? But how are you guys keeping it in your mind? Or it's muddy for everyone. Powerful. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Excuse me. Power is like velocity, and energy is like distance. Yeah. And energy is proportional to distance. So power has, you're considering time and energy, you're just considering the net. Um, and yeah, if this is feeling uncomfortable, I would practice it for the first quiz, like get that into your head. Um, and come talk to Amit or myself if you want to spend some more time on it. Yeah, so I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, confused about the dissipation of energy in the grid and the having the wrong length of wire. So basically, what we talked about last week was that the longer the wire, the more um, the bigger a resistor you have. And the bigger a resistor you have, the more heat loss you have. And the more heat loss you have, the less energy transfer you have, because more of it is going into heat, and less of it is go getting to your end source and your end use. So that was the, the basic gist of last time, was that you're never going to be able to transfer electricity perfectly from one system to another, because there's always going to be efficiency losses. But the farther a distance you have to travel, the more loss you're going to have. And so you need to either minimize the distance or minimize the resistance associated with your wire in order to have a successful transfer. Um, I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Um, if not, again, come talk to us. Um, still a little confused about batteries. Um, again, talk to us, because that's too general a question for me to know what to answer. But um, hopefully, uh, we can th sort it out together. Um, and then estimations of my daily energy consumption would be easier with given values of wattage for common appliances. Yep, <laughs> sorry. So the whole idea for this was to practice the estimation and then use those estimates to do your first pass at your daily, daily energy consumption, but then have the time on the homework to refine those estimates um, with actual real numbers. But the intent is to practice those estimations, so that's why I didn't just give them to you. Um, and then one last question was the source differences between um, we talked about the load differences, but we didn't talk about the sources. And so we were sort of doing a black box source. And so we'll talk about solar power in more detail and wind power in more detail um, coming up. But uh, yeah, right now we're sort of thinking about it as a black box. So that's why it's muddy, because I haven't made it less muddy yet. Um, OK, are there any questions about all of that? So one thing I wanted to mention, just to finish up on the Q-Drum, because I didn't want to talk about it too much until you guys did all your readings and stuff, um, is some of the criticisms of the Q-Drum. And I also show the HIPAA roller just so you see a different um, version, but a similar approach. Um, so what do you think some of the criticisms of the Q-Drum might be? Leaks. It leaks, yeah. So once it starts leaking, um, it's a pretty crummy technology to have. Yeah. Yeah, so on terrain, like is shown by that boy, it's, it's pretty manageable. But stairs were sort of an extreme version of terrain. But you can imagine in super steep areas, it's, it's not so fun to use. Um, so terrain is one concern. Um, the longevity, the leaking, what else? Yeah, so that's a really big issue on a Q-Drum, because you have your valve right at the edge of the drum. And so your valve is rolling in the mud, basically. And so every time you open and close the, wa the drum, you're getting dirt into the drum, which makes it dirtier. I, someone in this classroom told me that the Hippo Roller now has a UV light inside it. 
um, to try to address that issue. They also have their valve a whole lot higher up um, in terms of um, water cleanliness issues. So that is one of the limitations of the Q-Drum is just how dirty your water has the potential to get. And it's pretty near impossible to clean out a Q-Drum um, successfully because of the way it's constructed. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so a whole lot less versatile and expensive and prevalent, right? Like you can find a five gallon bucket everywhere, pretty much, or the equivalent. A Q drum, you can almost find nowhere. <laughs> so, um, and if you think about shipping a five gallon bucket, they stack into each other. So you can fit a whole lot more five gallon buckets in a shipping container than you can Q drums. And that makes the Q drum a whole lot more expensive because shipping costs get very high very quickly. Any other thoughts of concerns? One of the biggest ones when this technology came out was they used pictures like this one to advertise it. And people were horrified because kids were carrying water. Which is a really interesting thing to think about, right? Because kids are already carrying water. So it's not actually a very sensible concern from um, the approach of what is really happening. But from a where are you getting your money from <laughs> concern, it's huge. Because if you alienate all your donors by showing them an improved reality, but they aren't aware of the real reality and you don't educate them well, you destroy your donor pool. Um, and if you're going off of donations, which you'd have to do in a QDROM because it's so expensive, um, that's a real problem. And so I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of the QDROM for me is what, you know, it seems so great. Kids are dragging water instead of carrying it. What a huge improvement. But if your donors are assuming now you're, this is allowing children to carry water who used to be in school, then all of a sudden no one will support you. Um, so it's a really interesting aspect of this type of work. And then just to check in on where we are, today we did lighting and community partner introduction. The lab will be Friday. Next week will be um, solar, thermal, and PV and the quiz. Um, in the flip order is what we just decided. Um, and then, yeah, this is, this is where we're at.